there are a lot of popu popular teachers who love to teach on the Trinity and they want to defend it against anyone who disagrees that this doctrine is in the Bible. And indeed, this doctrine is not in the Bible. So these popular preachers, you know, use their reputation to back them up. But really, nothing can stand against the truth. And that's why I do these videos. Because some years ago, I was a Trinitarian. But the Lord revealed to me one day that I needed to study the Word of God and not to add or take away from it. And of course the Trinity came up right away because the Trinity is not found in the Bible. The word Trinity is not. They say the concept is, but if you really study it, not even the concept is there. And I've done so many videos, now videos over 500 probably, and many of these, the majority of these, I would say 80% of these are about the Trinity, the falseness of the Trinity. Now today I want to point to something very, very important. I believe that most of the popular preachers that defend the Trinity, Protestant or Catholic, I believe that they are misleading the public by stating that the doctrine is in the Bible and all they use is some verses in the Bible to try to prove the Trinity. They never allude to the history of the Trinity, the origin of the Trinity. They never allude to that because they know. They know that if they go into history, they're going to be found out to be liars. Now, think about it. If the word Trinity is not in the Bible, then where did it come up for the first time? This is what all serious Trinitarians should be talking about. If they really believe that their doctrine is biblical and of God, then they should show where did the, the, the word Trinity come up for the, in the first place. You see, they don't do this because it's not convenient. And it will destroy their idea that the doctrine of the Trinity is biblical. Because the first place and the first person to coin the word Trinity was a, a bishop by the name of Theophilus of Antioch. And this man wrote about the Trinity. And it is written in the Antonician Fathers' uh, writings. It is well documented how, what he believed about the Trinity. And I believe the reason that most popular preachers don't want to go into the origin is because if they go even to the place where Theophilus started quoting the Trinity, they will see and then they would have to tell the, their people that Theophilus was a Greek philosopher who called himself Christian, but he still upheld philosophy as a gift of God. And he took his ideas from none other than Philo of Alexandria. And this is very, very important for you to know. If you're serious about following Jesus, following the Lord, then you need to know the truth. You cannot ignore the truth because popular preachers are putting their face on the camera and saying with a straight face, that they believe the Trinity is biblical. We must unmask all the popular preachers and we must unmask all the false teachings that are going out about the Trinity. And we have tried to do this with over 500 videos as I had mentioned before. But now I want to deal with something very important that any doctrine that is not found in the Bible will be found in history. Any doctrine, I repeat, that is not found in the Bible will be found in history where someone put it into the church. And so let's start with Theophilus of Antioch and his writings. Since none of the popular preachers want to teach on the origin of the Trinity because they know they're in trouble, but I'm going to teach you something about the Trinity, the origin of the Trinity. And I call it the Trinity 101 class. And funny, but in the writings of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, in volume 2, where it talks about Theophilus, the first person to coin the word Trinity, I'm going to read some things to you. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you.
it, it says here, and this contain the pattern and type of a great mystery. For the sun is a type of God and the moon of man. Already you can see there's confusion there. In like manner also, page 101, the three days, also the three days, which were before the luminaries, or types of the Trinity, of God, His Word, and His Wisdom. Incredible. I'm going to jump down a little bit at the creation of man. For God, having made all things by His Word, and having reckoned them all, all mere by works, reckons the creation of man to be the only work worthy of His own hands. Moreover, God is found as if needing help to say, Let us make man in our image. This is Genesis 1.26. After our likeness. But to no one else than to his own word and wisdom did he say, Let us make. This is very, very, very important. What can you say about that? And, and then if we keep going down, it says, this is on page 103. The God and Father indeed of all cannot be contained, and is not found in a place where there is no place of His rest. But His Word, through whom He made all things, being His power and His wisdom, assuming the person of the Father and Lord of all, went to the garden in the person of God and conversed with Adam. Here's uh, Theophilus teaching that God, the Supreme God being, does not move, does not do anything, but He sends His Word. or He sends a second divine person. Watch this on page 103. But what else is this voice but the Word of God, who is also His Son? And then he says, He begot this Word, uttered, the firstborn of all creation, not himself being emptied of the word, reason, but having begotten reason, and always conversing with reason, and has the only, hence the only writings teach us, the holy writings teach us, and all the spirit-bearing men, one of whom John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and this is John 1.1, 1, 1, showing that at first God was alone, and the Word in Him. Then He says the Word was God. All things came into existence through Him, and apart from Him, now one thing came into existence. The Word then, being God, and being naturally produced from God, whenever the Father of the universe wills, He sends Him to any place, and He coming is both heard and seen, being sent by Him, and is found in a place. Interesting. There we have Theophilus teaching on God, Word, and Wisdom. Something that you would ask, well, where did Theophilus of Antioch get this teaching? You know, where did he get the idea that God was three? Where? Because later on he says that the Word of God is the Son and Wisdom is the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that. On page 98, we pick up where Theophilus of Antioch is saying, God then, having his own word internal within his own bowels, begat him, emitting him along with his own wisdom before all things. He will later teach that the word was the Son and the wisdom was the Holy Spirit. And this was, would be taken up by Irenaeus also. And then he says this, uh, he had this word as a helper in the things that were created by him. And by him he made all things. Listen to this. He is called the governing principle because he rules and is Lord of all things fashioned by him. He then being spirit of God and governing principle and wisdom and power of the highest came down upon the prophets and through them 
spake of the creation of the world and of all other things. Incredible. Please note that there is a connection here with someone who did come up with the Trinity. Theophilus is not inventing anything. He's not teaching something new. He's taking his ideas from Philo of Alexandria. Let's start where Theophilus talked about the three days before the luminaries. And let's look at Philo's works. Philo's. And we'll look on page 290 where it says, And the three days which passed before the creation of the sun are equal number to the three days of the first week which came after the creation of the sun or the luminaries. Right? For thus God allotted three days to eternity before the appearance of the sun, and those which came after the sun he allotted to time. The sun being an imitation of eternity, and time and eternity being the two primary powers of the living God. The one, his beneficent power in according, according, accordance with which he made the world, and in respect of which he is called God. The other, his chastening power, according to which he rules and governs what he had created, in respect of which he further denominated Lord. And these two here state, he here states to be divided in the middle by him standing above them both. For it says he, I will speak to you from above the mercy seat, and in the midst between the two cherubims, that he may show that the most ancient powers of the living God are equal. That is to say, his beneficent and chastising power both being divided by the same dividing word. Here we see the language that Theophilus was using. Philo was the first to use it, talking about the God and his two powers that came, uh, you know, before the luminaries. And so this is interesting to know that Theophilus was not the originator of the Trinity concept. It was Philo of Alexandria. Now, the reason the Trinity came about was because of this Greek Jewish philosopher, Philo of Alexandria. He knew the Word of God, but he also was very mixed up with theology, mixed up with Greek philosophy and mysticism. This is Philo of Alexandria. And he was not really accepted in the first century by his own people, the Jewish people. But later on he would be accepted, his writings would be accepted by the Apostolic and Antinicene Fathers, which are the Catholic Fathers. Listen to this on page uh, 83. I have also on one occasion heard a more ingenious train of reasoning from my own soul which was accustomed frequently to be seized with a certain divine inspiration, even concerning matters which it could not explain, even to itself. Which now, if I am able to remember it accurately, I will relate. It told me that in the one living and true God, there were two supreme and primary powers, goodness and authority, and that by His goodness, he had created everything, and by his authority, he governed all that he had created, the governing principle that Theophilus mentioned. And the third thing which was between the two had the effect of bringing them together was reason, for that, for that it was owing to reason that God was both a ruler and good. Now of this ruling authority, and of this goodness being two distinct powers, the cherubim were the symbols. Wow. Very interesting. Philo had a, an experience. He had a mystical experience where a voice told him that God was never alone. That with God, there existed two powers that were equal. And he calls one of them the governing principle. The same as Theophilus. The same. There is no mistake in this. Theophilus copied the three days before the luminaries, the Trinity, the God, Word, and Wisdom, and he copied 
from Philo on the governing principle also. Now, if you still have doubts that Philo was the one that came up with the Trinity, listen to this. This is found in page 11 of On the Creation. It says, And he would not err who should raise a question why Moses attributed the creation of man alone, not to one creator, as, as he did that of other animals, but to several. And then on the following paragraph it says, It is this account, on this account, that Moses says, at the creation of man alone, that God said, Let us make man, citing Genesis 1.26, the same as Theophilus, Let us make man, which expression shows an assumption of other beings to himself as assistance, in order that God, the governor of all things, might have all the blameless intentions and actions of man when he does right attributed to him, and that his other assistants might bear the imputation of his contrary actions. He calls those two powers two other creators. There is no mistake here. Philo was teaching a trinity of divine persons. And he allegorized word to be the, the son or the one who did all the things. And wisdom, Sophia, to be the Holy Spirit. This is how the trinity came about. Philo Alexandria was the first to start teaching on this because of its mystical experience. And Theophilus took it up. Not only Theophilus, but all the Apostolic and Antinician Fathers. This is the truth, and this is the, the class, the Trinity 101. I will leave you with this. I've, I've shown you that Trinity was first coined by Theophilus of Antioch. And then I took you to the works of Philo, where some of the similar words were used, such as powers, such as the governing principle, the three days before the luminaries or before the sun, and on and on and on. There's many more things. Uh, Philo used Genesis 126. Theophilus used uh, Genesis 126. Uh, and then Theophilus also used John 1.1 1, 1, and all these things. But I'm going to leave you with this. I said at the beginning that if the Trinity or any other doctrine is not found in the Bible, it has to be found somewhere in history. And this is the truth of the Trinity. Although the Trinity was believed in the 2nd century and it went on to the 3rd and 4th century, it was at the Council of Nicaea, 325, that they really put emphasis on the Trinity doctrine. And this is something that you need to understand. In other words, all our popular Protestant preachers are, are saying that the Trinity is biblical, but they're covering up the fact that the Trinity was given to us by the Roman Catholic Church. And if the Trinity is not found in the Bible, guess what? Is it found in the history of the Catholic Church? The answer is yes. I'm going to give you an example of all the things that happened uh, during several centuries. And with this, I will leave you. God bless you on your search for the truth of God's Word. I'm going to give you some historical dates from this book, Revelation, illustrated and made plain by Tim LaHaye. And there's other books that I have that give dates, but I thought it would be interesting to relate these dates. Now, Tim LaHaye was a Catholic, well, was a believer in the Trinity. And it's important for you to know that when he gives his dates, he jumps over the date when the Trinity was given which was 325. It was established as state law, and the Roman Catholic Church was a state religion. He overlooks that, but he still gives us very valuable information. Remember, if it is not found in the Bible, it will be found in history. The book by Tim LaHaye, The Revelation Illustrated and Made Plain, gives us some important dates and it also points to the church of Pergamos, which is in the Revelation, one of the churches of the seven churches, as being the Roman Catholic Church. In AD 300, the prayers for the dead 
in AD 300 making the sign of the cross. And it should have been AD 325, Council of Nicaea, where they installed the Trinity as the state law. Now, AD 375, the worship of saints and angels. AD 394, Mass first instituted. AD 431, the worship of Mary begun. In 500, priests began dressing differently than lay people. 526, extreme unction. 593, the doctrine of purgatory introduced. 600, the worship services conducted in Latin. And 600, prayers directed to Mary. In AD 607, Boniface III was made the first pope. In AD 709, kissing the pope's foot. AD 786, worshiping of images and relics. 850, the use of holy water begun. 995, the canonization of dead saints. 998, fasting on Fridays and during Lent. 1079, celibacy of the priesthood. 1090, prayer beads. 1184, the Inquisition, 1190, the sale of indulgences, and 1215, transubstantiation. In 1220, the adoration of the wafer. In 1229, Bible forbidden to laymen. In 1414, cup forbidden to people at communion. In 1439, the doctrine of purgatory decreed. In 1439, the doctrine of seven sacraments affirmed. In 1508, the Ave Maria approved. 1534, the Jesuit order founded. 1545, tradition granted equal authority with the Bible. In 1546, apocryphal books put into the Bible. In 1854, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. In 1864, the Syllabus of Errors proclaimed. In 1870, the infallibility of Pope declared. In 1930, public schools condemned. In 1950, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. And in 1965, Mary proclaimed Mother of the Church. As you can see, all of these are not in the Bible, but they are found in history because history reveals false doctrine.